Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure in the name of the Law School of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul to welcome here Professor Reddy uh, from the director of the Lewis and Clark Law uh, Program, um, Animal Law Advanced Degree. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. And to begin also this um, uh, new semester, our um, uh, uh, CDA conference. Uh, CDA is a center for European and German studies uh, that uh, is uh, founded by the uh, DAAD, Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst, the German service for uh, inter uh, exchanging and, and cooperation and um, is a joint project between two universities, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre and the uh, Catholic University also here in Porto Alegre. So we have uh, um, a cluster that uh, uh, studied and make research about globalization, about uh, sustainability and also uh, cultural diversity. So we are very glad uh, to uh, put also in our agenda the animal law and the new uh, subjects of this uh, team in, in, in general. So I thank you very much, uh, Laila Moliterno, our LLM candidate that helped to put this uh, um, uh, conference together, but also in a special way, uh, Vanessa, uh, Garbini, that uh, uh, from far away, but uh, in a very uh, kind uh, way, have helped us uh, to organize uh, this uh, conference and we will also act as a commentator. And uh, to, today we have also a special guest, Professor Tatiana Skeff from the Federal University of Uberlandia, also, uh, 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 also uh, our uh, star in uh, international law uh, that uh, help us in uh, many negotiations at the Hague Academy and also um, in many international forums that is, uh, will uh, act as a commentator is also an interesting uh, uh, professor in this uh, subject. Uh, so, I, I welcome uh, very much these uh, three colleagues uh, that will uh, uh, give us um, an interesting um, uh, panorama about uh, the Animal Protection Treaty, this interesting project from the Clark and um, Lewis and Clark uh, Law School. And um, uh, for this presentation, normally uh, uh, the organization of this uh, conference are made by the can LLM candidates. So I, I give the floor to Laila Moliterno uh, to um, introduce uh, properly our uh, colleagues and also to make the, the presentation. Laila, please. Thank you, Professor Lima Marquez. So we will begin with uh, Professor Reddy, who is a founding member of a Lawyers of the CAP. He directs the Global Animal Law and the Animal Law Advanced Degree Programs at the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark School, and he teaches in, where he teaches international animal law, animal legal philosophy, immersion topics in animal law, among other subjects. Dr. Reddy also serves on the Lewis and Clark Three Campus Committee on Equity and Inclusion, the Law School's International Law Committee, and as a confidential advocate. Outside Lewis and Clark, he chairs the International Subcommittee of the Animal Law Section of the American Bar Association, and he serves as a board member of Minding Animals International. He has previously served on the executive committees for animal law sections of the Oregon State Bar, Humane Voters Oregon, and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Nonprofit in Compass. Prior to joining the Center for Animal Law Studies, Dr. Reddy has earned his PhD from Lewis and Clark University School and his PhD from the University of Georgia, where his dissertation. Uh, was about representation of human and non-human animals in post-colonial literature and rights discourse. 
um, on behalf of, of all the students of the Center of European and German Brazilian Studies, we thank Professor Reddy once again, and we um, I give you the floor, Professor Reddy. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction and Vanessa and Claudia and Tatiana, everyone for um, arranging for this for this talk and this event. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, the focus of my talk today is going to be the Convention on Animal Protection for Public Health, Animal Welfare and the Environment or CAP for short. Are we able to? Uh, um, but before diving into the draft treaty, um, I'd like to get um, slightly political, if I may. Um, I won't presume that this particular group that I'm speaking to now is familiar with um, the past Trump administration's rhetoric in the early stages of the pandemic. But once it was clear that the coronavirus had taken root on our shores in March of 2020, the Trump administration started to refer to the virus as our quote unquote invisible enemy. And to be sure, they weren't the only ones. And I, along with others, have meditated on this particular sort of framing for quite some time. And I think there's a sound if self-serving reason for it, the logic being that this invisible enemy would be a, a common one against whom we could, so to speak, lock our arms and unite, against whom we could cast our leaders as wartime presidents who must be kept in office to see us through this sort of figurative fight. Um, but I think this contrivance of a hidden enemy also suggests, if not you know, outright declares, that we couldn't have seen this coming and as such, we couldn't have prevented it and that no one should therefore be held to account. And I'd like to push back against that view in light of the fact that animal advocates and others have been warning of the threat of zoonotic diseases or diseases that can be passed from non-human animals to humans for some time. And for those who are knowledgeable about this issue, it's never been a question of if, um, but when. Um, next slide, please. And indeed, if any of you are familiar with this 2011 film, Contagion, it prophetically dramatized almost this exact scenario that we're experiencing today, this transmission of a virus from bats to animals used for food before spilling into humans via wet market type conditions, which more or less hues to the predominant view held by the scientific community today as to how SARS-CoV-2 emerged in Wuhan, China. And this particular script has played out numerous times and in the same region with recent memory pointing to the SARS outbreak of 2002 in Guangdong province, again in China. And let me say here, not so much as an aside, that in this sort of retrospective pandemic era interview, um, Steven Soderbergh observed that the real focus of the film Contagion was about how we would respond as individuals and as states um, and as countries and as a people to um, a global crisis really of our own making. Um, next slide, please. And so along with Scott Burns, who wrote the screenplay for the film, basically neither of them could have contemplated just how inept the US and arguably many governments would be in the face of a public health crisis like we're facing today. And what Soderbergh observed is that sort of in directing this movie about this invisible enemy, so many decisions had to be made regarding points of view and whose perspectives we could and couldn't see. And on that note of sort of sight or perspective, one of the questions that I've often heard leaders and politicians asking is, well, how didn't we see this coming? Um, next slide, please. And so that had actually been a topic of discussion for many of us in the animal law section of the ABA or the American Bar Association. When the pandemic was so clearly a consequence of how poorly we've treated animals and our encroachment upon and devastation of their habitats, you know, how could we draw appropriate attention to their interests, but also offer a constructive path forward? And given that 75% of human diseases are zoonotic in nature, you know, we determined that an animal protection treaty could help prevent future pandemics. And we wondered whether this could be, you know, this vehicle to finally give animals the visibility that they sorely needed. And we knew that animal protection and improved animal health actually inures to the benefit of human health and to the environment. But 
given the fact that so many of our governments have put blinkers on to sort of keep us from seeing and to keep us from caring about animal suffering, along with species and biodiversity loss and habitat destruction, would the world really even care? And the question was, could we even convince the American Bar Association to care? Next slide, please. And so just for a, a little bit of context, the American Bar Association is the world's largest volunteer association of lawyers. And it takes positions on numerous issues which are brought up to it um, by some of the sections within it. So in the form of these resolution and reports or R&Rs. And these R&Rs go to the ABA's House of Delegates, which meets you know, three or four times a year to vote on these resolutions. And historically, many in the ABA have not been receptive to this notion that resolutions related to animal protections should even be taken up, if not adopted, with the general argument being that animal issues aren't germane to its goals and missions. And so in drafting our resolution and report, we underscored you know, several key ABA goals, which include advancing the rule of by working for just laws, providing for leadership to improve um, the law to benefit society as a whole, which we have argued within our section is inclusive of animals, and to promote our own members' quality of life. And really, you know, who couldn't argue or who could argue that their quality of life hadn't suffered dramatically during the pandemic? And although not listed here, we also cited the ABA's constitutional foundation, which calls upon it to apply the knowledge and experience of the profession to promote the public good. And the resolution that we drafted read, and you can read it there, you know, resolved that the American Bar Association urges all nations to negotiate an international convention for the protection of animals that establishes standards for the proper care and treatment of all animals to protect public health, the environment, and animal well-being. Well -being. And it also called upon the U.S. State Department to take sort of a leadership role in these negotiations. And in that report supporting or maybe even informing this resolution for an international animal protection agreement, we pointed to, um, next slide please. The long and um, sadly tragic history of zoonotic disease outbreaks, including AIDS, which jumped from chimpanzees to humans, um, Marburg and Ebola, which jumped from bats to monkeys into humans, SARS, which I mentioned earlier, which spilled over from horseshoe bats to civets and then to humans, Nipah virus, which jumped from bats to pigs to the people farming those pigs in Malaysia in 1999. And although it's less contagious than COVID, Nipah virus is actually far more deadly with some estimates putting it between a 50 and 75% mortality rate, which I think should strike fear in us given that, you know, even in the midst of the current pandemic, we've had multiple outbreaks of Nipah and other viruses and to potentially see some of those viruses be, be more contagious um, would be catastrophic in, uh, in a way that would sort of put our COVID numbers um, or make our COVID numbers um, seem um, small by comparison. And of course, there's also COVID-19, which all of the evidence, the great weight of evidence points to having emerged in horseshoe bats before likely passing through an intermediate animal, likely a civet into humans. And I'm sure more, you're more than familiar with some others, including you know, African swine, swine fever, which crossed oceans during the midst of the pandemic and led to dozens of outbreaks in the Caribbean, um, among other places. And I think what all of this attests to is that our high risk contact with wildlife and not to mention our treatment of domesticated species, whom we subject to environmental, physical and psychological stressors, particularly in the farming sector, um, thereby increases their own susceptibility to disease and then therefore our own. And I won't go into it for, for time's sake, but um, these outbreaks are far more common in our history. Um, next slide, please. You know, we only have to look at sort of the past hundred years or so to see um, evidence of this. And this particular retrospective is all the more distressing given the fact that the OIE or the World Organization for Animal Health was created in 1920, so basically 100 years ago to the outbreak of COVID, to stop zoonotic disease spread. And 
what occasioned its creation, um, I think should resonate with this particular audience. It was the emergence of rinderpest or cattle plague in Belgium when zebu when zebu cows were being transported from India um, to be shipped to Brazil through the Belgian port of Antwerp. And so although the OIE does some laudable work in sort of the formal sector in some countries, it doesn't actually have enforcement mechanisms and doesn't offer guidance for informal breeders or doesn't speak to how wet markets should treat animals. And so we still see these diseases emerge and cross borders, a testament to the need for us to create a more robust international framework to prevent the um, pre to prevent the outbreak of zoonotic diseases. And it's again, not just with respect to the realm of animal agriculture. Um, next slide, please. It also touches upon puppy mills, mink farms, outbreaks from labs, the treatment of captive animals and hunting. And again, just for time's sake, we can't go into, into all of them. Um, next slide, please. And so what we underscored sort of repeatedly in our One Health approach, um, what we sort of underscored repeatedly in our, in our report, our resolution report was this One Health approach, which highlights the nuanced interrelationship among human, environmental, and animal health, which I'd add is inextricably tied to the um, the well-being of animals and thus their protection. So it's not just that we should be scrutinized at markets, um, which some have referred to as being these sort of cauldrons of contagion, or the human environment into and destruction of wildlife habitat, um, thereby sort of erasing what buffer zones exist. It's also the way that we treat animals who um, reside under our control, their treatment in captivity, their treatment in uh, rearing and transport and trade. Um, slide, please. So to return to that resolution, some in the animal law section viewed it as arguably our most bold um, resolution that we'd ever submitted to the ABA. And we were submitting it to the ABA House of Delegates, which has, mind you, attorneys who represent a number of industry interests, including um, animal testing, animal agriculture, animal use for entertainment purposes, and more. Yet this resolution passed with overwhelming support, something on the order of two to three, two or three to one. Um, and let me take a moment here to say that I don't want to sort of overstate the impact of the resolution's adoption by the ABA. It's not a legal document, it has no sort of binding effect, no um, direct impact. But I don't want to undersell it either, or at least what it represents. Um, animal law attorneys in the ABA make up maybe 1% of ABA membership. Our numbers are actually so few that we can't actually form our own section, yet we were able to convince leaders of those other sections that, one, you know, we have to open our eyes to the interests of animals, if not for sort of ethical reasons, for the intrinsic value that they have, then at least to ensure that we as humans, as a species, don't banish ourselves. Um, and two, that animal well-being on an international scale it's within the purview, if not lies at the core of the ABA's overarching mission to create more just laws. And three, that it's incumbent upon all states to take these steps necessary to protect animals because zoonotic diseases and other pathogens don't recognize political or geographic boundaries. They don't have passports. And in an increasingly globalized world, they're just as equipped to shut down travel and commerce in the US as they are in China, as they are in India, as they are in Brazil or Norway. And so with all of that said, the ABA only voiced its support for the resolution. Um, as a body, it couldn't actually advance the effort itself or go to the US State Department on our behalf. And at the time, our group, um, those of us who had sort of put together this resolution and report had been discussing whether we should ourselves take that that step and draft the treaty to have something in hand to present to states. Uh, next slide, please. And so coincidentally, that same month um, that the ABA adopted our resolution, March of 2021, the WHO, the World Health Organization, issued this clarion call to states. And that open letter pointed to the pandemic as the biggest challenge that the world has faced since it was torn apart by World War II. 
at this time when re leaders realized that they couldn't embrace sort of this lure of isolationism if they were going to secure peace and prosperity for future generations. This kind of prosperity that could only be realized through mutual accountability, mutual obligations, transparency, and cooperation. And what we needed was an international agreement as it would prove a fatal mistake to treat COVID-19 and other zoonotic diseases as a singular occurrence. And indeed, the question was no longer if this would happen again, but when it would happen again, and would we be prepared? And as if underscoring, underscoring sort of the etymological root of that word pandemic, which literally means all people, this open letter offered sort of this haunting remind, reminder that none of us are safe until everyone is safe. And to that end, the Director General of the WHO, along with heads of 25 states spoke in this single voice um, to say, uh, next slide, please. That we believe that nations should work together towards a new international treaty from pandemic preparedness and response. And the question um, is, what would that entail? And some of the measures that have been proposed um, include things like equitable access to testing, to treatments, to vaccines, um, improving health systems across the world, making sure that everybody has access to active um, equipment, and also creating alert systems, data sharing, research, um, improving local and regional and global production and distribution of medical and public health, and increase in cre and creating, excuse me, um, appropriate sort of countermeasures for when this next happens. And to date, countries have been um, meeting and proposing numerous changes to the international health regulations along these lines so that, you know, not if, but when the next pandemic comes, we'll not only be better prepared for it, but better situated to respond to it. And I want to just pause for a moment to say that I believe that these efforts should be encouraged and actually celebrated, and they should be advanced to become international law. But when we look at this particular construct, I would argue what we see is built-in complacency. And I think it's invited by this particular framing for the proposition of not if, but when, I think suggests that pandemics are just going to happen and that we have no control over their prevalence. But we do and we can act to prevent them, even if we can't prevent them all. Um, next slide, please. And the key to this is one that the WHO and world leaders have already given voice to, arguing that a treaty would also include a recognition of a One Health approach that connects the health of humans, animals, and our planet. But the question is, where does that fit in? Next slide, please. And so we see it here, but what goes into it? Next slide, please. And if we're being sort of critically honest, we need to be concerned with that particular interrelationship about the health of humans, animals, and our planet. And we see the 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 health of humans being a tattoo with respect to pandemic, pandemic preparedness and response. But when it comes to pandemic prevention and this, this, um, uh, this sort of, uh, argument we give to, or, um, or just a citation of this one health approach, we don't actually see it fit in. Um, what states are currently doing or what they're currently trying to negotiate. So it's against this backdrop um, of the need for a One Health approach to prevent um, zoonotic diseases that I'd like to sort of delve into the treaty now. Um, next slide, please. And so let me note that the text that, um, that some of you may have or that you can find on our website, conventionalanimalprotection.org, is the first full draft of the text, which we'll see modifications in the coming days. And Vanessa is actually going to be there um, helping us to um, revise the treaty. And for anybody in the audience who wants to read the treaty and wants to offer feedback, 
um, in the next few days, please do, because we'll be considering it and revising the treaty along um, those considerations. Um, so with that said, I think we can dive into the draft treaty. Um, I'd like to be a little sensitive to time, and so I won't discuss sort of each point, but highlight one here and there. Um, next slide, please. And so the CAP begins with the acknowledgement that our high-risk interaction with and mistreatment of animals under our control is a key driver of the zoonotic and other pathogenic risks that we face. Um, and this is this further acknowledgement that it's, it's only by integrating sort of animal, human, and environmental health under this one health paradigm that we can even begin to sort of mitigate that risk. And then we have this testament to our desire to make the cap palatable for states, this recognition that we derive distinct benefits from our use of animals. So this isn't sort of an animal abolitionist treaty. Um, but even with that recognition of economic and other benefits um, and this nod to sort of state sovereignty, the idea is to affirm that animals as sentient beings like ourselves have this intrinsic value and merit protection for their own sake. And here we sought to um, expand upon sort of this traditional notion of welfare and broaden this duty that we would owe, which could be conceived of more holistically as animal well-being, which takes both um, negative and positive physical and affective states into account. And so despite you know, welfare being the title of the treaty, it appears here for the second and sort of final time in the text um, as it is again sort of broadened into the concept of, of animal well-being. And what level of animal well-being consideration states owe, um, we recognize has numerous dimensions. Um, and although these are um, suggestive or um, more than suggestive of carve-outs, many states couldn't, you know, constitutionally even ratify a treaty um, without these present. So the floor is essentially lowered so that um, more states can hopefully ascend and join um, the cap. Um, next slide, please. And here we also set the cap apart from other treaties or other international um, constructs or frameworks which have failed or would fail to adequately protect us or only would protect us um, in certain instances. So even those international bodies whose sole mission it is to prevent the spread of zoonoses themselves have a narrow purview and no real enforcement powers, as is the case, um, as I observed earlier with the OIE, which requires that states create these um, veterinary authorities um, to offer sort of general guidance um, in key areas, but doesn't actually obligate states to treat animals in any particular way. Um, and for those and some of these other enumerated rationales in the preamble, our contracting parties um, enter into the cap. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of fundamental principles, we enshrine a recognition that human and non-human animals coexist and are interdependent. And this gives rise, we believe, to ethical obligations to act responsibly towards animals. Um, we prohibit, um, and this language comes up in a lot of um, state laws um, as well, cruel treatment and unnecessary killing and suffering. And we call to ensure that their well-being um, is ensured through um, suitable environmental um, controls and um, that those controls are species appropriate. Uh, we also acknowledge the multivalenced nature of animals who um, are further um, susceptible to disease due to physical, mental, and environmental stressor stressors. Um, and critically, we argue that parties um, regulate the taking control, transportation, and keeping and more of reservoir species, or those species um, in whom viruses are naturally found, um, and intermediary species like um, pigs, cows, companion animals, and the like. And though not mentioned here in the principles, we also regulate ourselves in relation to both of those, um, both of those categories of, of animals. Um, next slide, please. So this is um, actually an aspect of the CAP that we're going to be spending um, a lot of time this upcoming weekend to addressing and um, uh, in line with comments that we received. But um, upon ratifying the CAP, 
um, under the current draft treaty, um, a party is obligated to first identify those species who are susceptible to being reservoirs or who are sort of natural hosts of zoonotic diseases. And a lot of people have pointed to um, bats um, as an example of this. Um, second, um, we require states to regulate the interaction amongst those species, humans and other animals. And so the question is, well, what does or what could this look like? Um, and that could be, for example, preventing encroachment to their habitat, whether for human or agricultural development or otherwise, um, which I realize could have significant um, impact there um, in Brazil with um, some of the clear cutting of the rainforest. Um, and then under Article 4, um, we submit those species identified under Article 3 to a risk assessment and remedy committee, which is composed of these sort of national scientific experts from party states who would then prepare a report for parties to vote on which species we would include in this annex, um, Annex 1. And in this annex, we might see species or even a subspecies listed or listed by some other taxon. Um, along with where the nature of the risk is that's involved, um, whether it's direct or indirect zoonotic disease and the location of those species. So in addition, parties then vote on whether the risk and precautions are needed um, with respect to a specific locale or if it's sort of a global um, issue or, or concern in nature. And with respect to those Annex 1 species in a party's territory, they're required to prohibit their capture, um, prohibit the keeping, sale, farming, and international trade of those particular species. And you might see some overlap here with CITES. Um, and this more or less serves as um, a carve out for wild breeders to, um, to be able to continue, um, but not with, um, with respect to those, the species who present um, the greatest risk. And that said, you know, parties are nevertheless required to mitigate risks, even in that wildlife breeding context. Um, and this is in addition to regulating live animal markets where wildlife are present. And what would we regulate for? Um, well, to ensure that the animals um, or the species are isolated, to ensure that the animal's well-being is accounted for, to ensure that they're, um, that the conditions are sanitary. And these duties would be carried out by the state um, and informed in large part by, um, uh, next slide please, by each party's uh, science and health authority, which is created under Article 5. And so our authority here, in addition to educating the public, provides an annual report to this risk assessment and remedy committee that details, again, the location of our Annex 1 taxons or species, their proximity to other animals and human settlements. And this would include things like agricultural um, uh, farms, uh, the nature of the risk posed, and the mitigation strategies that are taken or could be taken, again, to mitigate that risk. And this includes, if not encourages, habitat preservation and, and buffering. Um, Next slide, please. So from here, we have a number of um, context-specific protection for animals. And I've noted an asterisk here, um, which one of these are repeated throughout the other section, so I won't repeat them. But we see um, uh, the cap requiring us to um, attend to the, the health and well-being, both mental and physical and environmental for all of the animals in these um, different sort of use categories to mitigate the risks of zoonotic diseases and other sort of pathogens. Um, and we have to evaluate, you know, whether their well-being can even provide it, be provided for, and if not, states should be prohibiting these particular uses. Uh, next slide, please. And when it comes to transport, you know, basic protections like ensuring the species are kept separate, that those NX1 species or those who present um, the, the greatest risk don't come into contact with species, other species when they're being transported, to make sure that um, their welfare is accounted for and that they're protected from injuries. Um, for companion animals, we promote um, vaccination campaigns and sterilization campaigns, which is work that the OIE is already doing. Um, for commercial animals, um, largely agricultural animals, to ensure that they are kept isolated from not just wildlife, um, but all other animals. And this is an argument that a number of industrial animal agricultural producers are already making because they don't want um, undercover investigators, um, things like that to come onto um, their property to document 
um, oftentimes um, what's happening to these animals. And so this shouldn't be um, something that the industry uh, opposes. Uh, next slide, please. Here we see um, requirements that we would minimize the use and prohibit the use of NX1 species um, uh, with respect to laboratory testing. Um, laboratories would also be required to publish the number of and um, types of species used in their testing and to tell us why that they are using these animals for testing. And this would be um, integral to keeping the public aware. Um, a number of states, uh, Mexico, I think most recently this, this past year, um, banned the use um, of and the sale of cosmetics that have been tested on animals. And I think they are now the 40 something, 44th state to do that. And so the cap would require um, all states to ban the use of animals for cosmetic testing and phase out animal testing where alternatives exist. Um, next slide, please. The cap would also require that animals used in entertainment aren't harmed to that particular use, that they aren't being subjected to uh, performance enhancing drugs. Um, and so again, all these questions um, under the cap obligate these parties to the treaty to accept as, as binding under the cap. Um, next slide, please. And the treaty also contemplates um, additional protocols in the future, which could offer deeper dives into any one of these animal use categories that I've already mentioned. It could also contemplate species specific protocols like with elephants, cats, dogs, um, even whales to, for example, go beyond what the International Convention for the Regul Regulation of Whaling does right now um, and, you know, make it so that the global moratorium on whaling um, is not something that could ever um, be dropped. And um, so we wouldn't see states engaging in, in whaling in the future. And so I'll note here that CAP envisions or you know, rather mandates that parties who desire to become a party to the treaty um, or to a protocol must first be a party to the umbrella convention, which is focused on zoonotic disease risk. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of the status of things at present, um, we are looking at this um, specifically from state-led negotiations, although we are looking to make contacts um, at the UN as well. Um, in terms of sort of stakeholders, um, animal protection organizations, environmental protection organizations, public health um, organizations, um, in terms of the frameworks that we see the CAP um, uh, speaking to or, or engaging with the international health regulations, which are being um, proposed for amendment, um, the World um, Organization for Animal Health, the OIE, the World Trade Organization, specifically the SPS agreements, which calls upon states to, um, or which allow states rather, to prevent the import of products that endanger public health um, and that also allow for states to reject. Um, lower animal welfare products um, based upon um, plant and animal uh, life considerations, human health considerations, or even just public morals. Um, and we've actually seen um, a couple of cases along these lines play out. So states would actually have the ability to enforce um, these measures in a way that actually supports their, their trade interests. Um, next slide, please. And so here we see um, also prospects of states, you know, what are some of the issues, the prospects of states sort of listing and tracking those species, what states would have um, the capacity, economic and person power to do that. Um, what about, you know, wildlife consumption for vulnerable populations? And here we're looking to, um, to argue that, you know, in terms of the cost benefit analysis, we lose so much more in the face of not just pandemics, but also epidemics. And so I think in a revision of the cap, what we're looking to do is to require states to provide funding to ensure that states with vulnerable populations don't necessarily have to depend on wildlife. Um, and we see this in a number of treaties, for example, like um, the Convention on Biological Diversity, 
which requires a number of um, you know global global north states to provide for um, habitat preservation and the like for a number of global south states. Um, we also want to tackle um, the industrial um, use of step therapeutic antibiotics, which are used so heavily to make animals grow faster. And because animals are confined um, in such um, close quarters, what we're seeing is a number of very virulent bacteria emerging um, in settings and bacteria that are um, and that are um, resistant to antibiotics. And some advocates have pointed to this, uh, public health advocates have pointed to this as sort of the shadow pandemic that we're not paying attention to. And so we're looking to, again, call more attention to that in um, a subsequent draft. Um, and then potential development of protocols beyond sort of zoonotic diseases um, to really sort of shore up what the cap um, can contemplate in, in total. Um, next slide, please. So with that said, um, that's sort of an overview of the cap um, and sort of the, placing it in that historical context um, and international context. But um, thank you all so much um, for, um, for attending this presentation. I look forward to addressing any questions you have. Thank you very much, Professor Reddy, for this uh, very interesting and I, I think inspiring uh, presentation. And uh, now we have some uh, comments uh, for our in uh, special invite uh, guests, uh, but later uh, we can make a, a overall discussion. Lila, please. So I will introduce our our debaters, Professor Tat Professor Tatiana Skiev, uh, who is a permanent professor of the postgraduate program in law and a professor of international law at the Federal University of Uberlandia, Brazil, and a, Bra and a Brazilian expert appointed by the Minister of Justice to work at the Hague Conference on Private Law. She's a researcher in different areas, which includes international law, human rights, sustainability, critical theory, and international consumption. And we also introduce Vanessa Garvini, who is an animal law candidate at, a, at the Lewis and Clark College in Portland. She holds a master's degree in the international law from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And she's a specialist in international law and comparative European and German law and in European contract and consumer law by the University of Savoie Mont Blanc, France. So Professor Skeff, Professor Garbini, the floor is yours. Um, thank you uh, very much uh, for the introduction, uh, dear Lila. Uh, thank you, Professor Claudia, for the invitation to be here. Um, hearing Professor Rady and um, on his talk regarding this possible convention, which um, I would like to say that first, the, the very first sentence that kept me um, from, from your talk was that Zoonoses account for the vast majority of emerging infectious diseases. And this is a reality that the world uh, was uh, leaning towards, but did not know how, to, how it would react when it came into uh, reality, and it did through COVID-19, uh, which um, at least gives us a space to debate how important would be a convention to um, protect animals and protect animal well-being and not considering it uh, through an anthropocenic point of view. Because um, from, from where we stand in international law currently, although there are studies and views that promote the need to see animal as not only uh, for themselves, uh, apart from human beings or even apart or as part of a nature and nature being seen as a whole different from humans. Uh, what we see in international law that currently our schemes, our normative um, schemes do not see this um, as a reality. And we indeed, we need to change that. And this convention that you presented today, uh, the draft 
would be an amazing start for us to think about the protection of animals and to protect animal well-being. For instance, um, uh, there are a couple of situations that Brazil went through in the last few years that also uh, point to this need to um, converge on the protection and on the erection of such legal scheme. For instance, in 2018, uh, we had a, a great debate on whether we should export animals, uh, live animals, uh, to other countries. And we had a gigantic um, environmental disaster because um, many animals died. Uh, we had more than 20,000 animals being or cows being placed in a, in a ship for exportation. And we had a, a, a great disaster, uh, but called environmental disaster in light of this anthropocenic scene. Um, because of that, a positive side was we was that we had a tentative uh, law being proposed in our Senate, uh, which would actually prohibit all exportation of uh, live cattle. But it was archived uh, two years later. So what we see is that when we have these problems and these issues, it seems that everyone uh, seems to be on the same page on the need of protecting. But after a, a few years, it seems that that problem seems to be in the past already. And this convention would be an important start in order for us to have it as a vivid and current and ongoing problem that we need to face. And uh, for that, I think it's wonderful that uh, this proposition is being actually uh, built. Uh, we indeed need mechanisms to guide markets uh, on how they uh, may treat animals. And by all means, the World Trade Organization is not the correct forum to discuss these issues. Um, I thought it was brilliant um, that there is a dialogue with the WTO, especially consider the SPS agreement. But even if we talk about the um, a chapeau of Article 20 or Article 20's exceptions um, that, uh, in, uh, that are intended to permit or to allow restrictions on trade uh, in order to protect animal welfare, um, it, it seems interesting because for that matter, for the WTO, these are seen as products. Animals are seen as, are seen as products. And so uh, to have another perspective would be very much important for what it is intended to uh, uphold and what is intended to build around it. Because by all means, there we will not um, put forward this, um, this many concerns that we have. Uh, towards animal well-being, animal health that this convention seems to propose. So um, I, I would like, if possible, to hear a little bit uh, more on the um, on the mechanisms that uh, uh, they are proposed. Are they only, um, let's say, positive uh, prescriptions that would tell us how to deal with um, the exportation of animals or animals for uh, companion animals or how to treat them? Or would there be also mechanisms in order to promote this view and to promote even other um, possibilities to challenge states' actions? Or if this would be a second part of a, um, maybe an amendment or maybe a protocol following later on? Because it seems to me that it is important also to have these prescriptions because we don't, but it is also uh, important to have mechanisms to challenge states' action when uh, dealing with with this sort of problems. Because we we do have some conventions such, such as the CDB, the Convention on Biological Diversity. We have the Convention on Conservation of Migratory Species and Wild Animals. We have the CDS Convention, <laughs> but it seems to me that they all lack a mechanism, like a proper mechanism to challenge states' uh, actions. So this would be something that I would like to hear a little bit more of you. And, and thank you very much uh, for your presentation and the presentation on 
on this um, uh, convention that I agree, it is imperative to change this Anthropocene that we, we are currently having, and this would be a great start. So thank you very much for um, presenting it to us and uh, today at this group. And thank you again, Professor Claudia, Lila, and Vanessa for the invitation to be here and to hear these comments and be able to also pose some questions. Yes, thank you so much um, for those, yeah, uh, very kind remarks. Um, and I think it's a, it's a critical question. And it's a question that, that dogs a lot of, I don't know if you have that saying there, but a question that plagues <laughs> um, a lot of these international treaties in that on the surface, the protections might be great, but there are no enforcement mechanisms um, to really hold states accountable. And I think of this particular issue as very um, much in line with um, our, you know, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement in that whatever one state does with respect to um, anthropogenic climate change or, um, you know, air pollution, water pollution, whatever, it doesn't stay located in that particular state, but um, the harms are, um, are externalized to all other states. And I think that speaks to sort of the critical nature of, or the critical need for a climate change agreement. And the same thing with zoonotic diseases and those risks, those, those diseases don't stay within borders. The, the harms that, or the, the activities that any state allows to happen within, within its borders is externalized unnecessarily to all other states. And the question is, why would any one of these states enter um, into um, or adopt any of these um, these measures in isolation if the chances are that they're going to be receiving those externalized harms from from all other states but so I say that to to just sort of underscore the need for states to not go about this alone but to hold each other hold each other accountable through these uh, mutual obligations and the cap itself does have a provision um, that points to the permanent court of arbitration as the entities, um, in addition to sort of um, um, interstate um, arbitration, but the permanent permanent court of arbitration as the entity who would take up um, any any disputes. But in addition to that, one of the things that I don't want to say works out really well here, but one of the things that that is helpful is that animals are goods under the World Trade Organization. They are commodities. And we see, even right now, for example, with respect to the UK, who is having to negotiate all of these new trade agreements with other countries, and Australia being one of those countries with um, a large number of um, live export animals, um, because the UK has such high, comparatively, such high animal welfare standards, um, which not only help those animals, but also help the environment and, and public health, what they are, what the farmers in those states and therefore the politicians in those states um, who are being lobbied by those, um, by those farmers, what they're arguing for is higher animal welfare protection standards in order for um, Australian um, sort of cattle, um, Australian cattle industry or whatever the case may be to be able to engage in trade um, with the UK. And I think a very similar can happen with respect to, especially in the commercial, um, with respect to commercial animals, making sure that if we are going to trade with this other state, that we frame it either as um, a public uh, moral question under the WTO Article 20, or we frame it as um, an environmental issue, or we frame it as um, a human health and public health issue. And that could uh, tackle things like um, not just um, uh, uh, you know destruction of a forest for um, industrial animal agriculture, but also the use of subtherapeutic antibiotics and so on and so forth, um, as a way to ensure the states are abiding by this, even if they don't want to adopt the treaty. So why not adopt the treaty? Um, and again, you know the provisions are are not particularly dramatic. Um, states could easily sort of adopt this. And then sort of create sort of a, a level platform um, when it comes to international trade so that states are, instead of being disincentivized, are actually incentivized to treat animals and to treat the environment better. Uh, 
Um, uh, greetings, greetings, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you. It's such an honor for me to be back uh, to my research group, which I consider my house. Um, I want to I want to thank Professor Claudia for being once again such a such a generous professor, uh, uh, expanding the umbrella of the group now to embrace also animal protection. So I'm really grateful for for this opportunity, um, and thank uh, Dr. Reddy also for the opportunity to participate in this um, amazing uh, initiative. Uh, to help drafting this this convention that I believe is going to make a huge difference for animals, humans, and the environment if we get to get it approved and supported. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Dr. Reddy, for your presentation. And I think the impressive timeline you presented to us of zoonotic diseases spreads throughout time um, it's maybe the reason why such a bold initiative, as you mentioned, was approved and accepted by ABA, right? Um, as you also pointed out, we animal law advocates have been saying for a while that it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when the next pandemic is, is going to happen. So I think that's the world is finally um, realizing the importance of that issue. Uh, as Dr. Reddy also mentioned uh, the world is getting more and more globalized. Uh, the postmodernity um, um, establishes uh, even more connections between countries and peoples. So this will, will only happen more often from now on. And um, I thank also Professor Tatiana for uh, underscoring the that even though there might be um, an apparent overlap between what we are um, um, suggesting, should, suggesting and offering with this convention, with other uh, uh, conventions, international conventions that already exist that approach animal protection, like CITES, like uh, the CDB, etc., the Convention on uh, Migrant Species. Uh, this one, this initiative, is a, has a different approach. Um, it encompasses all animals and it has a perspective of including their, their well-being as part of the well-being of humanity and the environment as a whole, just like the One, the one Health approach um, um, supports, right? Um, and um, one thing I really appreciate about this convention, uh, is this draft convention, is the fact that this, uh, that as I mentioned, it encompasses animals that haven't been covered yet. And uh, I also, uh, I'm very um, connected to the protection of farmed animals and we don't have uh, resources uh, in, at an international level for, for those animals, for, to protect those animals. Uh, yet we know that pandemics are um, abundantly spread in uh, industrial and anim agri uh, animal agriculture um, sphere. Um, so I don't think we do have much time, but I would like to invite Dr. Reddy to speak a bit more about the idea of including also uh, livestock production and breeding in this convention and how and, and the importance of that initiative. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, it's a good one. and. Um, you know, one of the things that we struggle with is, at least in this first draft, is to what extent are states going to be amenable to addressing um, what we call here in the U.S. concentrated animal feeding operations or industrial animal agriculture issues, given sort of the, the great economic weight and the number of um, individuals in, in their countries who engage in that particular industry. Um, what significant hesitancy would they have if they saw um, particular issues related to those particular animals that would that would require them to sort of change their practices? And so we've we've been somewhat hesitant to sort of touch upon the, those particular issues as fully as I think we should. And it's one of the things that we're we're discussing um, in um, 
in this upcoming weekend, and Vanessa will be part of that that conversation. But you know, I don't think we can turn a blind eye to the the creation of these these super bugs, um, so called super bugs, um, these um, antibiotic resistant um, uh, pathogens, and the the fact that these um, that these pathogens are already breaking through some of our last lines of defense so that you know we might be returning to the middle ages the dark ages where you know a paper cut if infected could kill you because we don't have anything to stop that bacterial infection and again um i don't think states are paying attention to this particular issue um to the extent that they should and you know advocates are pointing to this as again being um the shadow pandemic. Um, and I would encourage you all, um, everyone attending this this event to, you know, just Google um, uh, uh, these outbreaks and you'll see them um, coming out of these factory farm settings. And that in and of itself is one issue, but then again, that we have to use these subtherapeutic antibiotics is because the animals are cramped so closely together that um, they all naturally catch um, diseases from each other. And that because the, the pathogens don't have to wait very long to jump to a new host um, before killing their current host, they can kill their hosts um, all the more quickly. So again, um, just a, a recipe for, for disaster. And um, the last thing I'll say too is that I, my fear um, with respect to how we're approaching um, pandemic treaty negotiations is that, um, to borrow potentially a, a metaphor here, is that we're attending to the symptoms of our diseases instead of the root causes of those diseases, and it's require you know the voices of. Um, everyday people and advocates in the public health, environmental um, health and animal health sectors, um, speaking to their elective representatives to get this on their radar because otherwise um, there are too many incentives, economic incentives for them not to address these issues. Thank you very much. Uh, Lila, do you have a, a question? from the public, please. Right, thank you, um, Professor Reddy. And I would like to, to ask you, as you have pointed out, that animals and hu um, human beings should be seen as a part of an interdependent ecosystem and that we share also a, a history in common and a, a he he evolutionary heritage, as you said, and intrinsic value. Um, although we as human beings have like the uh, positive responsibility or obligation to protect them from unnecessary sufferings, I would like to know in which ways we can contribute. We can contribute to this cause that brings up a, a, a very different perspective and a really necessary warning of, uh, for human uh, or for the mankind health, right? Uh, how we can contribute to that as young researchers or LLM students, uh, um, even though we have uh, promoted spaces, maybe you can bring us uh, or you can uh, tell us more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I think our both of our countries are similarly situated insofar as um, we both have a very um, significant industrial animal agriculture presence um, and are both facing um, or dealing with governments um, that are, uh, I don't say, that are beholden to some industrial animal agriculture interests um, and that are putting sort of profits above, you know, environmental and public health issues and, you know, to answer your question, I mean, I think it's on the one hand, there's um, there's advocacy you have to do on the home front um, with respect to, you know, your home country or your state and your country and calling to whether it's local or state or national politicians, um, these particular issues and how they interrelate. And then, you know, really pushing them 
to be those voices raising these issues um, on an international level. Because again, you know, it's important that every country take these steps, but no country is going to be motivated to combat climate change on their own or combat, you know, these risks uh, related to zoonotic disease spread or um, subtherapeutic antibiotic use or animal welfare um, on their own if they are receiving sort of those externalized risks. But um, the, the difficulty that we're having and that, you know, you and your group um, and your contacts can help with is, you know, bringing this to the attention of your government officials um, and really pushing them to um, to raise this in these pandemic treaty talks. Because like I said, um, it's unfortunate that we are sort of paying so much attention to the, the, the fact that this is going to happen again, as opposed to limiting the amount of times that this happens um, because um, and the, the, the really disheartening thing about it is that it's the most vulnerable populations um, who suffer the most. I mean, I have maps about um, that point to still today, you know, vaccine inequality across the globe and um, who's getting third and fourth shots, booster shots, and then who hasn't um, gotten access to a single shot yet. And I think yesterday or today, they've discovered um, a variant of the Omicron virus. So that's actually far more contagious. And so these things are, sadly, they're, they're going to become endemic and we're going to have to live with them. And the question is how many of these things can we live with stacked one on top of the other on top of the other? Um, and if we don't stop them from happening in the first place, um, how much attention can we really spend or devote to living with them? I, I don't think I don't think that's that reflects um, a reality that that anybody wants to live with. It's just a question of which politicians have the courage to to raise this. Um, and I'll say too, you know, just for for you all um, academics, raising this this question at conferences, especially environmental and public health conferences, it has to be outside of the animal law or animal protection sphere, um, because my fear is that we have become so siloed that um, we don't realize just how interrelated um, these, these particular issues are. Thank you very much. This is uh, our very beautiful words for our, um, for ending this uh, inspiring moment. I want to invite Professor Reddy and also Vanessa uh, to publish this uh, draft. Uh, this uh, first one draft, I, I, I think, uh, in our Brazilian um, Journal of Environmental Law. I'm an editor of this uh, review is uh, by, uh, yes, uh, we, we, I think we have one in uh, March that we will prepare in March. If you can send us um, uh, the first uh, draft or the uh, second uh, draft with a, a little note about the importance of this, um, I, uh, I agree. This is a very important issue that should be out of the animal law scene and come for the, the um, international law uh, discussion. And so I, I, I want to also invite you, Professor Reddy, uh, to, to have contact with the International Law Association. Uh, the headquarters is in London, but uh, the, the US uh, uh, section is very um, um, engage and perhaps they can also propose a committee on animal uh, law or genetic uh, disease or something this that uh, will uh, uh, allow us as international lawyers uh, to discuss this uh, globally and not only in the uh, because it's already there in the american bar association uh, but could be really a global uh, issue and i, I think uh, also, the Chinese colleagues will will be very interesting to to discuss this uh, in a, in another forum that is not uh, local, no. Uh, so I I I I think this um, meeting it was very very inspiring, and uh, please think on us as a as a, a group that can help uh, to 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 spread a little more uh, this very interesting uh, initiative. And I congratulate you and uh, uh, Lewis and Clark uh, Law School uh, for being a leader in this uh, discussion. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you also, Professor Tatiana Skeff, 
uh, dear Vanessa Garbini and dear Laila Moliterno for organizing these and make it so uh, beautiful uh, this uh, beginning of this afternoon here in Brazil. I think it's, uh, it's morning in, <laughs> in, in the US, but um, it's, it's, it was really for me inspired and uh, I agree, is now or never. We should really push that this uh, come to, to uh, uh, a beautiful convention like you suggest. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much for having me. Thank you.